Hi, welcome to the meeting. I'm so happy that you're able to join us today. I'm Kathleen Swanson. I'm a member of the Project Santa Fe Foundation faculty, and I want to take you on a journey for the next 30 minutes to basically talk about how lab medicine can play a role in value-based healthcare. How can your lab pivot to be an important transition and this change that's happening in medicine today? And how you can do this through meaningful insights that provide information at a population health uh, level. So let's go on this journey. Um, I'm going to basically talk about seven issues um, in our discussion in the next 30 minutes. I want to cover what's behind this movement that we're seeing, what's driving this. I want to talk about what the meaning, the definition of meaningful clinical insights are so that we're all on the same page. We have a great starting point that way. I want to talk about specifically how you can use this in population health. And then we're going to talk about some things that will help you do this in your laboratory. How do you move in this direction? So let me cover the background first. This shouldn't be anything new to any of you um, on the meeting today. But let's just talk about what the current environment is and, and how that's helping us move in this direction. So currently, both payers and payment models are moving from a fee-for-service kind of basis to a value-based reimbursement model. In the United States, about 50% um, of contracts are now being reported as having a value orientation to it with more occurring each year. The, the challenge is this, is lab data is still being perceived as a commodity in this environment. The discussion is around the cost per test and what's the turnaround time. It's really not around what the value that lab data can bring to the table. And so we need to help shift this discussion in this direction. We also know that healthcare costs are totally out of control, way above the GMP, above any other um, components that we see. At the same time, we know that healthcare resources are stretched, they're limited, there's only a certain amount of uh, focus that we can give. And there are some people that would actually advocate that population help health that movement will help us in the move in the direction and support value-based health care. And then I don't have to tell any of you, but the COVID-19 pandemic on top of all these other challenges has been really interesting. What we see now is lab being thrust into the limelight and we have an opportunity to shine from this. So let's think about what our current lab information systems do for us and what's the current data model that we often use. The literature does have a couple of data models that are reported, but for the most part, these models talk about a transactional lab information model. What does that mean? We get one test in, one order, and we produce one result out. It also talks about, in the literature, significant problems and challenges because of lack of data interoperability across healthcare. We can't share data very well, and we really need to think about how to move that in a different direction. What I want to do today is um, talk to you about how to think about remodeling your data. How do you use a different data model in order to have longitudinal diagnostic insights. That's a key word that we're going to frequently go back to in our discussion today. So if you think about that for a second, let me give you some examples um, that will help anchor our discussion. 
So can you imagine remodeling the data so that you could see a patient's results regardless of who the provider is, but all done in the same laboratory? What about different treatment locations? What was done in the ER? What was done in the primary care office? What was done in the inpatient? That could be really valuable for preventing repeat lab orders, providing insights across provider lines. Think about um, being able to see the patient's total picture of health or care based on their lab results. Could you look at the course of a disease or condition over time? What if you could look at their diabetes over the last three or four years and see if the patient is in control or out of control? What if you looked at data across time, even if it was within the normal range? Uh, laboratorians have a tendency to think about data that it's within the normal or outside the normal, above the normal, below the normal. But what happens if a calculated creatinine clearance was being looked at as increasing even though you're still within the normal range? And what if you could use the data to actually screen patients for disease? So here's some ways to think about different ways of uh, presenting time. I want to talk a little bit more about the remodeling of lab data. Um, and I think this is an important thing to think about because um, you have to take some baby steps before you can um, look at the larger picture. So the first is to think about per presenting these clinical diagnostic insights on an individual one patient basis. So can you use this information specifically to do a targeted intervention on one patient. Is this patient a pre-diabetic that you've, you're screening and now you're going to diagnose them as having pre-diabetes? And now what do you do for that one patient to monitor that over time? Once you get that one patient component down, the next step would be to move into a population health um, kind of look at the data. So this, this one patient at a time helps us set the stage for the population health view. Now, moving along this continuum is basically occurs because of the data analytics capabilities. So we need to think about the data individually for the patient first and then at the population health level. So let's talk about health for a second. I know population health in many countries is much further along than it is here in the United States, but I'm, I'm going to address basically the U.S. market um, currently and, and how we think about maybe some population health issues. So population health can really support clinical decision making for groups of patients. But many people would say, well, wait a minute, we have all of this claims data that we could use to support population health. And they'll argue that they don't really need lab data to support population health because they have the claims data. Here's the challenge. Claims data is delayed one to three months, so it's not real time, it's not even near real time data. The second that happens with claims data is um, in, in the experiences that, that um, I've had and that we've um, worked with different groups, we can see a documented error rate of as much as 25% in the claims data. So if you're going to use this to make population health initiative decisions around, um, the claims data provides us a significant problem. If you think about using um, lab data for population health, we can use it across the whole spectrum of a condition or a disease. I think I've mentioned just a minute ago, you can use it for surveillance uh, of that population. You can use it for prevention of a disease or a condition. Can you stop patients who are pre-diabetic moving into a diabetic range because you can identify them early and prevent um, the disease from moving forward? 
and can you use it to monitor treatment? Now, I'd like to, you to think about using this data in a focus that has to do with chronic and high cost conditions. I think this is really where population health can play an important role with the lab data. You can look at a disease where the healthcare system um, is having a challenge solving it and, and it, and yet it is costing the healthcare system a lot of money. And if you focus by thinking about how, how this data can improve patient outcome or decrease the total cost of care, that really gets us to the mark of where we need to be. So let me give you an example. What if you could identify a condition or a disease upstream before it's severe? What about something like chronic kidney disease? Do you have the capability currently to identify patients in early stage chronic kidney disease and prevent them from moving into stage three or stage four, slowing the, the progression of that disease? Can you do that through surveillance or prevention with the existing systems and mechanisms that you have in place? Maybe. But um, in general, I would say, I would argue that most um, lab information systems are underprepared to move in this direction and that we should be thinking about this. I want to define for you clinical diagnostic insights. We're going to talk about four components that are currently part of a paradigm described in the literature as Clinical Lab 2.0. In this, Clinical Lab 2.0 leverages their clinical data to support disease management and to improve health conditions for a majority of issues that have to do with chronic disease that cost us um, significant amounts of money in our healthcare system and have a heavy burden for healthcare. So what we want to do is we want to take these lab 2.0 com components and we want to focus on early care, we want to focus on prevention, and we want to focus on well care, not once the patient is down the stream and already in sick care or hospitalized. So let me take you through the definition of these four components a little bit. I'm going to talk about risk stratification. So given the fact that labs are currently dealing with COVID right now, tell me, just think for a second, can you think about, can your lab stratify patients who were positive for COVID and have concomitant heart disease? I'll let you contemplate that for a second. So we have two totally different arenas, two totally different um, conditions that many patients have. So can you look at concomitant health conditions that lend the patient to being at a lower risk or a higher risk? Can you look at health determinants? that are existing in the lab data set. Do you know if the patient lives in a rural area where they have challenges getting healthcare? These are some examples of how you could stratify risk for existing patients in your lab data. The second example that I want to is gaps in care. I actually love talking about gaps in care. I am a clinician by background and training. And so it's interesting because what we think about with the lab data is not just what the patient has orders for and what data we have, but if you think about what gaps in care is, it represents testing that the patient doesn't have but really needs. If you had a patient with diabetes and you were following the ADA guidelines, it would recommend that the patient be tested two to four times a year for hemoglobin HbA1c values, right? So the question on the table would be, can your lab look at an, a hemoglobin A1c and tell us how many patients um, do you have 
where they have actually been tested sufficiently to meet the treatment guidelines. That's a good example, and I love using that one because the information really demonstrates that when it comes to following chronic diseases in healthcare, we don't do a very good job. We also have the opportunity to support performance measures, things like HEDIS, the Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set. Now, this is a measurement set for health plans um, to be able to measure their performance around. And oftentimes, data is insufficient um, it, to be able to, to help um, quality metrics. And so the lab can really play an important role in that. The third clinical diagnostic insight that I want to highlight that's part of the Clinical Lab 2.0 component is that of being able to pick out patients that are high risk. These are patients that are already, unfortunately, downstream. And so they might include things like uh, risk signals, like a lot of ER visits, or patients who require higher levels of care currently, and can you intervene on those patients to prevent um, future care from um, needing to occur by being some, having some preventative measures. You can think of lots of examples for identifying high-risk patients in your population. The last component of clinical diagnostic insights is to be able to take the information in order to generate um, focused care, which we call facilitated intervention. I don't, unfortunately, have sufficient time today in order to um, discuss this, but I do want to just mention that I think the lab has a huge opportunity to be able to provide care to patients and work with others to provide focused care for what the patient needs because of the frequent touch points that the the lab often um, provides to the patient. Okay, so now that we've talked about why we should do this and um, what are clinical diagnostic insights um, that could be provided, I want to talk about the ingredients that you may need in your laboratory in order to move this forward. Most important are your people. Any good administrator would tell you this, right? So what you're looking for is an integrated, innovative team. Let me say that again. Integrated, innovative team. If you would like to tackle this strategy in your lab, that is the building block for all future um, next steps. You would want to incur in encourage subject matter experts to be part of this discussion. So this would be pathologists, clinical scientists, but you also want people who are experts in the workflow process. If you thought about setting up a hepatitis screening and treatment panel that could occur with a single order in your laboratory, how difficult would that be to manage that workflow process? I often find that the people who are direct frontline employees involved in workflow are those that are the most beneficial for the internal team. The second um, that you may want to consider, too, is um, people outside your clinicians to participate in this integrated team or committee that you may want to set up. So billing and finance, they often provide excellent insight on what you can and cannot bill for, like if you were considering screening labs. Um, the legal team um, really needs to be hand in glove with your integrated team. They need to understand uh, data management and sharing agreements that you may need to work through and any repercussions associated with those. We often find that um, pharmacists um, can have a significant role in an internal lab team. There are a number of 
Laboratories here in the United States have hired pharmacists as part of their internal team. And you might say, why pharmacists? Well, pharmacists are trained to manage data. Uh, they look at um, treatment decisions and evidence-based strategies and, and um, what's the right decision to make around that. And maybe more importantly, um, drugs represent currently about 27% of healthcare dollar spend. So if you're going to use your lab data in order to generate changes in total healthcare costs, there's a huge opportunity here. Lastly, and, and maybe most importantly, you want to have some data analysts on your team, people that really understand the data. These these individuals are difficult to find. Um, uh, I've had some luck um, in my uh, career time to work with some who really understand this. And, um, uh, and they are, they're very difficult. So if you have them, hold on to them. They can be part of your hospital-wide um, system, your informatic system. But um, the challenge is, is if they belong to your hospital, they may not have sufficient time to get to dedicate to this initiative that you want to push forward. So it's something to think about. Second uh, ingredient is your data process proper. So um, I would put a big, big gold star by this one. Um, this often uh, limits laboratories in their ability because they have insufficient uh, data analytics capabilities internally, and uh, they're tied to their um, information system, which prevents them from managing this data in a way that's uh, meaningful. Um, what they, what we would really like to see in an ideal scenario is to be able to use um, data analytics really in a meaningful way for clinical care. Um, and the problem is, is that this is not clinical care as the lab sees it. This is clinical care as the clinician sees it. And when you look into the literature, what we often see is clinicians say they spend too much time in the EMR, not enough time with their patient. And that when they have to manage a, a complicated clinical patient, um, or let's just use an example of a patient with chronic kidney disease, they often um, cannot apply um, the clinical information uh, for that disease in front of the patient at that moment in time. So what you need is you need your data analytics to be in real time in order to support this. A lot of organizations have a data repository, but most data repositories are built for billing or actual, actual or data. I didn't say that right. Um, you know, to, to be able to manage that from a clinic, instead of a clinical standpoint, from a financial standpoint. And so um, you want to think about what components of a data repository are needed. You also need a robust um, enterprise master patient index. Um, so what's that all about? It's reducing the data silos that we have. I can get this data, but I have to go to finance. I can get this data, but I have to go to this part of my organization. So how can you bring this data together in your data analytics to make it useful? And then how can you use this information to stratify these patients to look at a community viewpoint. We've talked about what you need inside your lab, and we've moved a little bit to maybe what's outside the lab with your data scientists, but I really want to focus now on um, external partners that you're going to need to be successful. You have to solve problems that are important to your external partners. I've had a lot of examples where I thought we had a great idea to be able to work with someone on, but we weren't in alignment with what was important to them. And so really what we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, what problem are you solving for them, for your stakeholder or for your customer? What are, what's their pain point? Are they meeting their quality measures? Are they not meeting their quality measures? And if so, very specifically, what areas can you help in? 
is your organization looking for ways to decrease emergency room visits or decrease hospitalizations for a certain subgroup of patients, or maybe for everyone if they're on fully value-based contracting? And I would um, encourage you to look at partnerships that you've already developed. Those existing relationships can really move you far into this discussion of um, meaningful clinical insight creation. Um, some other ones that I have on the slides that um, you can think about is, you know, working with your administrators. Do you have a seat at the table with them to um, help them understand the value of lab data? Have you tried reaching out to partners such as health payers or health plans to see what and um, have you reached out to your information analytics people? They often have great data, but they don't know how to use it. And I think you can really provide support in that way. Let's see, let me move through these slides a little faster. We're gonna talk about measuring value. And um, what I would generally find is that measuring value could be both a clinical value and a financial value. So clinical value could be things like reducing emergency room visits or hospitalizations, improving a patient follow-up. And when we talk about financial value, I really want you to think about savings not within the lab. We're not talking about decreasing cost per unit, cost of uh, the lab test. We're talking about decreasing total cost of healthcare expenses. So an example might be, could you identify a patient early on in their disease or condition so that when they get further down in this disease, you can actually save that emergency room visit because you have a way to monitor those patients? Similar to what's being done in some cases in healthcare currently with um, heart failure or um, chronic kidney disease. I want to give you two examples. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is a recently published paper with diabetes surveillance. In this paper, um, the lab took five years of longitudinal data and they retrospectively examined this data to see if they were as good, if not better, than using the CDC model of identifying um, diabetes. And uh, the, the CDC model uses what they call BRFSS data um, or Burl's data, you'll hear it referred to at times. And in this study, using lab data alone to, for diabetes surveillance, they were able to get a, um, a percent of identified diabetes equal to that of what's considered our current gold standard, which is the CDC BRF SS data. The uh, other advantage was that this data was really accurate because it was based on lab results, um, although it does present a challenge in that it's a population that's being measured for HbA1c and it may exclude patients that um, are not being measured. So it, it's a great tool to be able to use for a population health initiative um, around diabetes just by looking at your longitudinal data for surveillance. The other example that I wanna give you is in pregnancy. Um, this information that I'm sharing with you has come from a special supplement of the Clinical Lab News. It's part of what was presented in 2019 as part of the Univance Healthcare of Excellence Award. And the goal of this project was to identify patients early in their pregnancy in order to ensure that they had adequate follow-up and monitoring with their lab testing and their physician visits during their pregnancy. And this was with a goal to decrease prematurity. In this, um, and to save total cost of care. In this um, case, there was significant value um, in this study because the, we were able to identify patients early in the disease condition. Um, about 
15%, 14% of patients were identified prior to the existing system. And um, we were able to decrease prematurity and close up to 60% of their gaps in care with this data. Now, I failed to tell you at the start of this discussion is that how this um, process worked is the lab um, had a partner, which were um, a health plan care coordination group that specifically focused on care for pregnancy and for pregnant patients. And so this collaboration led to these great outcomes. This isn't easy. Um, I want to tell you that there are barriers to being able to do this. And if I didn't present at least some of these barriers, it wouldn't be a fair representation of the challenges that the lab is up against. Um, I think that um, it's, it's oftentimes people have great ideas, but the ideas are too large to move forward. So you really need to think about how to do this in a small way, in a small pilot at first. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, patient care is uh, lots of spinning wheels and dials. And so one of the challenges is to isolate what role the lab has helped in that particular patient's care. The example that I gave you about prematurity with uh, pregnancy is a great one. The lab alone did not decrease um, premature births. It was um, the total healthcare system that helped focus on those patients. Um, you will hear, why are you doing this? You're just the lab. You know, you, you don't need to be doing this. So you need to be prepared to um, explain the value that you can bring to the table. You need to have a champion outside the lab. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, a prophet has no honor in their own house. And this is particularly true when the laboratory is trying to um, embed themselves to work with those outside the laboratory system in order to produce value. You need to align your um, priorities and the things that you're gonna focus on with those around you and in your organization. What are their top initiatives and how can you support that? There's a significant amount of data security requirements. And even though we may, your, your team may all speak the same language, the truth is, is when you have an integrated team, there's different technical and clinical terminology that people have to learn. I always jokingly say, I don't speak IT, I can barely spell IT. And that's one thing that you really have to, to take time to let the team learn and work together. There are some um, references for the discussion that I've had today with you. Um, and I want to end with this. Um, if you're interested in learning more about joining the conversation of how your lab can do this, Please join us as part of the Project Santa Fe Foundation. Your participation is welcome. Project Santa Fe is a not-for-profit organization with two clear objectives. One is to provide thought leadership in this area and help labs build evidence for how they can improve care and decrease costs. Thank you so much for today. I appreciate it. Have a great day.